Hey y'all, Andrew here with Free Tours by Foot New Orleans. Today I'm gonna to take you on a walk around the heart of the French Quarter, Jackson Square. This is the space where just about every visitor to our city ends up spending some time. So we're gonna show you the space where not only do most visitors come, but it's at the heart of the history here. It's one of the oldest pieces of the French Quarter and there's a lot of stuff to see historically and a lot of things to do. We'll share some of both with you. For starters, the elephant in the room is the namesake. So this square has been here going back to about 1721. The shape of the French Quarter as we know it goes back to that time, but it's only been called Jackson Square for about half of that time. And this guy is the namesake. So Andrew Jackson on his horse in the middle of the square is an addition from the 1850s. And it was created on the occasion of his death. There's a pattern with, you know, big public figures when they die getting monuments and oftentimes those public monuments are just kind of the person standing there looking heroic. This one's a little different in that it shows a really specific moment of his life and one that pertains to this exact spot that the statue is in. So what you're seeing here is a moment from the Battle of New Orleans in the War of 1812. The year is 1815 and Andrew Jackson, the major general during that battle, is looking over the troops before heading down the Mississippi to actually enter into the battle against the British. And if you don't know this story, this is a big turning point in New Orleans history. The battle itself was part of this sort of existential war for the United States that threatened to turn this very young country back into an English colony again. But victory could mean a little bit more standing on the world stage for this country that as yet didn't have very much of it. And locally, you know, New Orleans had only been part of the United States for a dozen years at that point. The battle stood not only to bring this big advantage for the United States as a whole, but also to bridge these conflicts in New Orleans that were between newly arrived Americans and the old Creole population who lived here in the quarter. They didn't agree on a whole lot, but they did agree that they didn't care to be under the English thumb. So the decisiveness of this victory against them was a really big deal for everybody involved. So the end result is that the heart of the Creole city, the French speaking and culturally French area, gets named for Monsieur Jackson well after this war. And funny enough, if you go over to the American city square where the English speaking power brokers were, that is named after the Marquis de Lafayette, a Frenchman who fought in the Revolutionary War. It wasn't a coordinated effort, but it did end up that both sides ended up paying homage to somebody who was sort of from the other side. Now, the statue alludes to that really specific moment, but it itself comes from several different moments. And it's really well spoken to by the various inscriptions on this statue. So when people walk by, Reading isn't always the thing you do when you see a statue like this. Plenty of people walk by and say, oh, Stonewall Jackson, or like, look at a $20 bill. And that's about the extent of their engagement with its story. But there are a few pretty telling little inscriptions. One of them identifies him as Major General Andrew Jackson. One of them identifies the sculptor, Clark Mills. And as a sculpture, so a lot of people, when they see a horse up on two legs like this, they believe that that means something about the person involved having died in battle. And while that may be true of some monuments, I can't speak to that. It's not true of this one, and it doesn't seem to be a thing that ever took root in New Orleans specifically. Andrew Jackson didn't die in this battle. What actually this indicates is that this was sort of a new sort of technology where sculpting like this, casting a statue in bronze on two legs had never been done before with the support being entirely done by the legs of the horse. So this was more of a look what I can do on the part of the sculptor than any other story. If people in New Orleans at the time were cognizant of this idea at all, it may have been more of a passive aggressive statement. By the time this statue goes up, the relationship was a less positive one. He had some bad blood with various power brokers in New Orleans and his kind of signature piece of legislation, the Indian Removal Act that initiated the Trail of Tears, the mass removal and hence kind of mass extermination of Native Americans from what today is the Southeast of the United States was criticized a lot then as well as now. So if people in New Orleans at the time were cognizant of the idea that a statue on two legs like this meant someone had died in battle, maybe they were saying what they wished had happened. The most conspicuous inscription on the monument is the one that says the union must and shall be preserved. And when people read this, nowadays, if you know American history, a lot of people, the word union defaults to the era of the Civil War, which gets described in terms of union versus Confederacy, with this odd implication that when the southern states left the United States, that the U.S. somehow transformed into a different country called the Union. Back before the Civil War, the word union just meant the United States, and it carried that connotation really all through American history up to that point. But 
after the Civil War, that term was toxified enough that it never really carried that meaning to the same degree again. So this is a quote that predates the Civil War. So what's going on here is there was a moment in American history that foreshadowed the Civil War when South Carolina threatened to secede from the United States over a dispute about tariffs, something that in retrospect looks fairly trivial to us today. And when asked for his hot take on that, Andrew Jackson responded with not exactly this phrasing, but approximately this sentiment, saying basically, we can disagree about stuff, but leaving the country is not a tactic that should be on the table. So that quote lingered in the public consciousness. Fast forward to the actual Civil War when South Carolina did secede and eventually Louisiana with it. And New Orleans got occupied really early during that war. And the man who oversaw the occupation had his best memory, at least, of that Andrew Jackson quote added to this statue in the middle of the square saying, the guy who you've lionized here doesn't agree with this thing that you just chose to do. So in that way, this statue dates to kind of four different moments. It depicts a moment in Andrew Jackson's kind of early political career that really launched his presidency. The statue comes from the era following his death. The quote comes from his kind of presidency and elder statesman career. And then the addition of the quote comes from after he was dead and his opinions were considered to still be pretty important. So as monuments go, a pretty complex one and one that stacks together all these different eras, none of which is immediately evident if you just look at the thing as you go by. Y'all, apart from the fact that this is here to commemorate a major moment of military history, it feels like a pretty chill hangout space for the most part. It's beautifully landscaped in a way that dates back to the time of the statue being added. And you've got a mixture of native and non-native plants. We've got some Mediterranean palms that were donated. We've got a lot of roses kind of indicating the, the, the French sentiments and also the English sentiments of the time when this was all landscaped. And then you've got some of the local favorite blooming plants. We've got azalea bushes all around the place, which aren't in bloom right now, but become really beautiful during the spring. And then you've got this ring of crepe myrtle trees, just like azaleas, those are also Asian natives. So they come from far, far away, but they're in bloom during the summer and we can use all the extra cheer we can get during the summer. The kind of botanical centerpieces, even if they're off to the edge, are Southern live oak trees. And these are native to the region and they are kind of one of the coolest thing that comes from the Southeast. They are oaks, but they're really different from your typical oaks from other parts of the world. Partly in that they're evergreen. So that's where the name live oak comes from. These things will keep putting on new leaves all throughout the year. And also they are really adapted to this hurricane prone region. So they grow relatively short and they tend to grow out rather than up. So especially when they're allowed to do what they want, these branches that come out and go sort of straight out would actually go down and touch the ground. And you get this deep root system and this kind of bracing system together that allow it to withstand high winds. The wood's really flexible too. And the result is that to the point these trees were ever used for building, they tended to be used for ship hulls, things that were subject to a lot of pressure in multiple directions. But you'll see them all throughout the city and the region oftentimes a lot sort of more wild and uncontrolled than this. And the thing you tend to maybe associate with them is the gray beardy looking Spanish moss that hangs from them. It doesn't love to live right next to actively used roads. Car exhaust isn't good for it, but it will uh, appear if you go out into like parks, even within the city, for example. So check out Audubon Park or City Park for a better view of those. And part of the New Orleans design aesthetic, intentional or not, is the combination of these kind of wild lines of nature paired with your kind of more controlled and man-made lines of cast iron railings in the background. Whether you're in the French Quarter or the Garden District or whatever other part of town, this combination can, uh, can really help you to know where you are. And this particular ironwork design is a really important one. We'll elaborate on that as we get to where the story is a little better set up. For now though, take you out of the park this way in order to show you the major buildings of the square. As we go, we also get a view of over there in the corner, you've got a cannon facing out. Another reminder that this is devoted to a moment of military history, although those corner cannons are paired with these innocuous little statues devoted to the seasons. So that chills things back out a little bit. We also have palmetto, which you'd see out in Louisiana wetlands. We have magnolias, which are the state flower. 
and then you got a little stand of plantain trees doing their best to come back from a, uh, a more than usually intense freeze that we had in New Orleans last winter. So if you come and check us out in person, you'll probably see these a good bit bigger. The square is also, it's the space for a lot of events. And so if you come out here, really you can't plan for it, but you're really likely to stumble across a wedding. They happen out here in the open quite a bit. Uh, this is also the site for caroling every Christmas, just a little bit before the day itself. And it's a place where um, you just kind of do your best people watching in the city, where everybody passes through at some point and you can actually find a bench to hang out on, which is not a real thing in most of the French quarters. So bring your food, bring your drink, bring your coffee, just hang out and watch the world pass in front of you. I lead tours that start in this neighborhood all the time, and I can tell you, you will see just about everything. Not quite as fast as you might see it on Bourbon Street, but at a pace that's a little easier to take in. So, if you're enjoying the tour so far, go ahead and hit the like button and help others discover the video. If you'd like to see more videos like this one, subscribe to our channel. We have walks through the French Quarter and Garden District, videos about Mardi Gras, everything you need to know about New Orleans. Visit our website for more about our tours, our travel tips, and more. We also have virtual tours and channels that focus on DC, New York, London, and more. Look for free tours by foot wherever you travel. You can support your guide with virtual tips, links in the description, and let us know what else you want to see. Leave a comment below. Now, back to the tour. I've mentioned the, the park sends mixed messages. You see some very peaceful, harmonious stuff and a lot of commemorations of a war. And the square as a whole sends pretty mixed messages too. Going back to the beginning of the city, this was the Place d'Armes, the Place of Arms, which was just a parade ground for the local armed forces. It was much, much more stark than this is. And today it still has this layout of a Latin American city square. When you look around the edges, you see a building that was originally built to be a home for priests. You see our cathedral in the center, St. Louis Cathedral. And then you have the Cabildo on the other side, which is named for the city council that once met there during the time when we were under the rule of Spain. Those are things that you would see in a Latin American city square. And the message they send is that you are in Latin America, which you are because of how we were colonized and how we were developed. But Andrew Jackson tells you that you're in an American city square. So the combination can be a little jarring, but it's all true at the same time. And the buildings here also give you mixed messages. In the lower floors of the Cabildo and the Presbyter, the style you're looking at is what we call Spanish Baroque. It's a Greek revival influence style that would have been popular in 18th century Spain. And then the tops of these buildings are what we would call Mansard, which is a popular style in 19th century France. Those are pretty incompatible in terms of you don't usually find them on the same buildings, but here they indicate heavy French cultural influence well beyond the time we were actually French and heavy Spanish influence, and that is all true as well. So all these things that are kind of one of a kind, if you know the, the messages you're being sent, they're unusual, but they're all true at once. And the story behind how these buildings came to look the way they did has to do with a huge fire in New Orleans that happened in 1788. We elaborate on that story a lot in our French Quarter tour, so I'd say watch that to get a sense of it. It's a dynamic story about one of our favorite pairs of New Orleans characters, a father-daughter duo, him from Spain, her native born in New Orleans, so what we would call Creole, and uh, it, it explains a lot of this. But the name Baroness Pontalba, if you want to learn about this on your own, is the name to look for. Anyway, they bring the square to look the way it does today, and she also is responsible for the development of everything that we saw inside. So a really complete transformation in terms of the aesthetics of the square and how it's used. It became a place to go for pleasure, basically, for the first time. In terms of that father-daughter story, y'all, it also has an element where this was developed in multiple drafts. And as you go along the fence outside the square, you can see what the previous draft looked like before the Baroness got her hands on it, but after her father did. So this is a plaque worth checking out when you're walking through to get a sense for how much things have changed. The fence along the square, y'all, ends up being the base for an awful lot of visual art. So the city licenses artists to show their work on any side of the fence, any of the four sides of this square, going around the park of Jackson Square, and also on the fence at the back of St. Louis Cathedral. And that license requires them to be showing their own work and to be showing originals. So most of what you see is one of a kind, or at least took effort for the artist to make each individual run. And it also should be the person there who knows the most about it. So if you wanna have a conversation about the work, they can do it with you. 
the buildings here, y'all, are museums now. So for visiting stuff out here in the square, you've got the Presbyter on one side, which is part of the state museum system. As you may know, the downstairs of this is a Katrina museum. And the addition of a museum is really the biggest physical thing that Katrina did to the French Quarter. Unbeknownst to a lot of folks, this is a, one of the neighborhoods least affected by the storm. And it would be easy for somebody, even back in like 2006, right after the storm, to come here and based on what they saw in the quarter, think that the city had fully recovered. And while we're happy that people are able to come here and still enjoy it, the fact is that the lingering effects of the storm are pretty huge. So this is a place to learn about both what happened back then and what is still ongoing. We also have a palate cleanser in the upstairs, which is a Mardi Gras museum. So if you go up there, you can learn about both the kind of contemporary Mardi Gras parade tradition and also what goes on out in Cajun country, the more kind of working class masking traditions here in the city, which can still involve some really incredible costumes, Mardi Gras balls, all this different stuff that you don't necessarily get to see, even if you visit all through Mardi Gras season. The cathedral is not a museum per se, but it is a space that you can step inside and visit, and it's a very historic space. You can see various artifacts significant to the local church, and also you can see oftentimes concerts going on in here. So music is usually gonna be promoted with signs on the front and the back of the cathedral. So anytime you're walking by this, get a look. Even if you're not someone who's into organ music on a regular basis, which is often what it is, experiencing it in this kind of space can really be an event. And so I would say like anytime you see one of these concerts going on, make it happen. More often than not, they're free to attend. There's also alleys on either side of St. Louis Cathedral, one named for the most famous priest to minister in this cathedral, Père Antoine, the other named Pirate's Alley, which ties it up with, uh, with Jean Lafitte, our famous pirate. And both named after famous men, they both serve purposes somewhat tied to those professions. Uh, Père Antoine Alley has offices for the church, which are not open to the general public. And then Pirate's Alley has a pirate-themed bar, which is. As well as you've got a bookstore named for William Faulkner back there because he once lived in the building. This one, the Cabildo, also part of the State Museum, more kind of general focus, although they have rotating exhibits that go into lots of different local subjects, so it's always worth checking to see what's on display while you're here. If you, say, took a French Quarter tour and you sort of got the bird's eye view of New Orleans history, you'd be able to see a portrait of Baroness Pontalba, who was the person behind building a lot of what you see here these days. Uh, you'd also be able to be in the place where the Louisiana Purchase was signed. They have one of the many copies of Napoleon's death mask, things like that. When you get to the corners of the square, y'all, it's easier to miss some of the stuff standing here, but for one thing, you have the street names. You have here what we in English call Charters Street, although in French, Chartres is a pretty different word from that. It tells you how not French we are at this point, how much the local language has changed. And going down St. Peter's Street, the other one, you have a few landmarks worthy of note. So we have here one of the sort of high-end restaurants that's available in the area, Tableau. There's a lot of good restaurants right around us. So the ones facing into Jackson Square are by no means your only choices. Just along the street, we also have Sylvain, we have Doris, lots of other great good ones close by. But a little along St. Peter's Street over here, just along from Tableau, is the Gumbo Shop, which is more of like a homestyle Creole joint. And contrasting high-end and more working-class Creole food, you get two pretty different experiences. I've elliptically mentioned what Creole means in New Orleans, which is if you heard that term out of somebody's mouth today, they probably are telling you more often than not that their family is mixed race and has been here a long time, going back before the Louisiana Purchase probably. It also could describe the language that those people speak, which is structurally pretty heavily coming from African languages, but has a lot of French vocabulary in it. Historically, if you find the word Creole written in like a 19th century document that you're reading for some reason, oftentimes there what it's describing is particularly the people who were French and Spanish extracted who lived here, who were born here specifically, it would have referred to the other group that I just described as Creoles of color. So it's an elusive term for exactly what it means in any setting, but when you're talking about food, it means a combination of French, Spanish, West African, and a few other cuisines, some Native American influence there, just to different proportions depending where you are. So when you go somewhere like Gumbo Shop, you're seeing a very traditional West African rooted menu that has the kinds of food that would have been prepared back in the 19th century by enslaved people for the consumption of people who were on the higher end of the spectrum. Some resemblance to French cuisine, but not a super, super direct one. Whereas the higher end you get, the more in the French direction you tend to go. A lot of places that call themselves Creole restaurants today also are just kind of doing 
modern food with a sort of New Orleans-y twist. So I would look at menus before you develop expectations about what you'd see. And restaurants in the quarter are always kind of meant for a visitor's eyes. I know people from New Orleans who say that gumbo shop is just like what their grandparents make. And then I know people from New Orleans who are like, gumbo shop doesn't remind me of my home food at all. So it's very much down to the individual. There's also at this corner, just beyond, between the two restaurants, uh, Le Petit Theater, which is one of the kind of arts institutions in the neighborhood, actually began in what we call the Upper Pontalba building, this building over here, and then moved over there. It actually used to include the space where that Tableau restaurant is today. So if you wanna see some live theater while you're in town, not something that New Orleans is necessarily as famous for, but which is generally quite well done over there, and it's been being done there for more than a century, that's a great, that's kind of the first resort place to look in if you want something locally produced and especially convenient to spending time in the French Quarter. And they do all kinds of different shows, mixture of musicals, straight theater, that kind of stuff, often with some kind of local interest involved. Speaking of theater, also back there in the direction of Le Petit was one of the several places where Tennessee Williams used to live in the French Quarter. So some of the theater about New Orleans comes from this immediate area. And still today we celebrate him with a Tennessee Williams festival, less a theater festival than a literary festival, but there's one especially theatrical moment that happens out here. So in the midst of a lot of very serious conversations with writers and publishers and so on, uh, they host a Stella screaming contest which is a chance for a couple of actors to depict both Stella and Stanley in hopefully very sort of persuasive ways. And down here on the street, anyone who wants to can submit themselves to scream Stella or Stanley in the most uh, Marlon Brando manner that they can. And whoever does the best impression wins a prize. Mostly just a ceremonial one, but it definitely attracts a crowd every single year. And Stella and Stanley, when that happens, are posing behind a cast iron railing here. And the cast iron railings on this building really set the trend for cast iron railings that extends all throughout the upscale parts of the city that were developed in the 19th century, French Quarter, Garden District, and plenty more. And this particular design tells the story a little bit of that Baroness Pontalba character. So if you go over there and check out that French Quarter tour that we did with the story of her and her father, what you can see in this ironwork is that in the center of each section, there's a reference to their family history. There's the letter A for Almonaster, the birth family name, and then P for Pontalba, the title that she ended up getting from the family that she married into. So looking for that A and P in the middle, you're seeing a one-of-a-kind design made specifically for them and describing this really unusual family. Uh, where the names chosen are only those that belong to the mother. The father, in a way, kind of got left out. This side of the square y'all facing onto Decatur Street leads you to a couple of different means of transportation, as well as an awful lot more art. So if you're wanting to explore the city at large, one of the places to do so, the hop-on, hop-off bus, takes off from right across the street here. On this side of the street, you have our mule friends. And these are all mules uh, horses are used by mounted police officers in the neighborhood, but not by carriage drivers. For various reasons, mules are better suited to the climate, a little bit more docile, better able to deal with uh, the social climate in the neighborhood, people who want to mess with them on Bourbon Street. And these guys do mounted explorations through the neighborhood, kind of a steady, guided ride and talk kind of thing. So if you want hey. a quick little take on the neighborhood at your leisure, but still being outside, this is a solid option. And you can just find these folks here pretty much all the time and talk prices and everything with each of them individually. Depending on when you're here, you may find some live performance going on on that side of the street. It tends to be bigger things, uh, visiting bands, you know, the kind of bands that involve several dozen people are often gonna be on that side, as well as some of our local acrobats We'll set up shop over there and do some pretty impressive stuff, although it takes a long time for them to build up, so bring your patience with you. And then, of course, on this side with Decatur, you also have Café du Monde, most famously. And we've uh, elaborated on that in a few videos. If you watch our French Quarter tour video or if you watch um, our culinary tour that we did with my colleague Kayla, then you can get some of the inside scoop of what that place is all about. So suffice to say right now you can see it's pretty hopping already it's 9 30 in the morning right now during the quietest part of the year and so just take that into account when you decide 
which of the 24 hours this place is open you want to visit. So y'all just outside the square, Spitfire Coffee, where this particular person is willing to wait in line for a few minutes. So, pro tip. And finally, y'all, we turn the corner to go along the lower Pontalba. You'd get the impression this time of day that there were more of the artists and performers on this side. It just happens that that's how things are proceeding right now. Oftentimes, you gotta go all four sides to find absolutely everything. And plenty of these artists, y'all, are uh, in, let's say, like a transitional phase of their career. Plenty of people have gone from showing their paintings on the fence to having a gallery of their very own in the French Quarter. And so you might very well be finding somebody who's on their way up in the world. So whether you are just looking to like get some eye candy or whether you're looking to invest in somebody who is a diamond in the rough, you got plenty of people to check out out here. The lower Pontalba, just like the upper Pontalba, is retail in the downstairs and a few restaurants. And then in the upstairs, it's still residential. And these are originally built to be these sort of townhouses with businesses on the ground floor. And someone who lived in them would have owned a whole vertical slice of this building, which would have given them a floor of business, two floors of residences, and then a, an attic floor that also could be residential. So nowadays, all of that has been broken up into single story apartments, the residential portion. And this building is owned by the state, the other building is owned by the city. So in either one, you're looking at a kind of uh, rent control sort of, at least rates that are a little bit lower than average, but where you're on a years long waiting list if you want to get into one of these buildings. But where you could get a sense of the interior and specifically the historic interior versus the people who hang out in them now is by visiting 1850 House, the museum portion of the state owned building that is right about in the middle. So if you pass by this sign, it's really easy to miss, but it's a little innocuous piece of the state museum system that is just one of these townhouses preserved approximately as it would have been when the place opened up, talking about furnishings and so on like you tend to see at a house museum, but also about residences, about the process of its building. And it's a nice immersive little like maybe half hour experience for a few dollars. So one of the more reasonable and uh, less attention span demanding experiences you can do in the quarter, I'd say a great fit for just a sort of intermission in the midst of a warm day. After that, you get back to the retail mode, but you always can look up at the second and third floors of this and get a sense of who lives here, get furniture on some, not so much on others, so you can tell which ones are crash pads and which ones are full-time residences. Heavy weight towards the former. And then you can see down the street from here, you can see out on St. Anne Street, the archway that leads into Armstrong Park. Jackson Square is far from the only city square we ever had in New Orleans, or at least the only space that ever served that function for somebody, even in an official capacity. So New Orleans has been divided into multiple cities at some points, and you would have squares for those cities as well. And then you had the space that sort of served as the public gathering grounds for enslaved people and free people who were African extracted, and that would be Congo Square out here at the end of this street inside what today is Armstrong Park, though Congo Square way predates that designation. So St. Anne Street, the street that goes back this way, connects these two city squares in a way that can help you kind of bridge what can otherwise be really separate feeling stories. So watch for that sign as you're out here and you'll see how close together those different spaces are, even though a lot of times tourists treat them as very separate experiences. And then at this corner, we have Stanley on this side of the street, which is kind of a breakfast place with a New Orleans twist and a lunch menu as well, though breakfast served well into the day is be exactly the thing for a lot of people staying in town. And then across the corner, we have Muriel's, a restaurant that we've given some detail to in our ghost tour video. So check that out for the lore around the place. You're also looking at Creole food there. So y'all, as you can see, Jackson Square, little bit of restaurant, little bit of retail, little bit of museum, whole lot of people watching. So. Come out here and spend some time. It's a great place to come without a plan because you've got so many options within easy reach. We got plenty more videos that'll touch on these things. Check out our culinary tour for more information about Creole cuisine, what exactly that means, where your options are, where to get some of the great classic dishes. You can check out our French Quarter tour to get into the area around this and how Jackson Square connects with all the other parts of the city and plenty more that'll get into things that connect with this more obliquely. So thank you for watching. Y'all please drop us a like, help people find the video, give us your comments, let us know what you've gotten to see when you've people watched out in this square, and please subscribe so you'll see these next time. If you wanna tip your guide, you'll find the links down in the description below. Thanks for watching, have a great day.